Okay, good. Uh, so the first message about how to write a good research paper is that nobody knows. Nobody has a monopoly on truth. So please, uh, can, can, is this too loud? Has somebody got a knob? <laughs> Already? There's a knob over there. But it starts to get too, too loud, you can turn me down. Uh, so please, um, uh, do me the honor of, yeah, of, of uh, responding, uh, sort of ask questions, make comments during the talk. We will still finish on time, I promise you. Okay, um, so my goal here is to uh, just make um, seven simple suggestions for things that, make, that I believe will make your research papers better. I want, so I'm deliberately being somewhat, um, somewhat specific, somewhat opinionated, in the hope of um, driving you out of the woodwork to the point where you actually respond and say, no, I don't agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's no fun if you just say anodyne things. Here is the first. Don't wait. Start writing now. So here's the usual plan for doing research. Have a great idea. Spend three years doing research. Write a fantastic research paper. That sounds like good scholarship. Don't have to be writing if you haven't done it. This is completely wrong. This is <laughs> You should, first of all, uh, you, you do need to start with some kind of idea, but then start writing the paper. Right? So, because writing a paper is, I, I can't tell you how many times I have accidentally done this, and when I get to writing the paper, I find that I didn't understand the thing that I thought I understood. Right? Writing the paper forced me to be clear, it sort of brought to the surface, it's a, like a crystallization mechanism. That, because you're trying to get it on paper to communicate it to other people, you realize you haven't even communicated it to yourself very well. Um, so it's really good to articulate what work you still have left to do. And it is also really good for communicating with other people. I'm right now writing, I've been doing some, something on automatic differentiation. At the moment, I'm just reinventing the wheel. I'm figuring out what Carl Elliott is going to tell you about at ICFB. But I've been writing some of it down, and now I'll be able to have a conversation with Carl here this week that I would not be able to have it was all fuzzy in my head. So it's a very good way to communicate with other people. Um, so the, the main message I want to get across is that you might think that, and naively you think, writing papers is a way of communicating results to other people. It's an output mechanism, but it isn't. It is the cogs and wheels of research. It is the primary mechanism, in my humble opinion, for doing research, right? Not just the means of reporting the research you have done. Does that make sense? That's super important. Number two, figure out what that key idea is. So here's my uh, sort of overall picture. I said it's not primarily about communication, but in, in the end, the, the, the one thing you hope your paper really does is communicate an idea from your mind into the mind of another person. So what, what's your name? Crystal. Crystal. So here's Crystal. Right? So there's an idea in my brain, and the goal of my paper is that, like a virus, I want to convey this virus from my brain into Crystal's brain so it will morph there and take over her entire uh, research program and then she will in fact Mariana and, and so forth. So the result is world domination, right? So <laughs> I like to think about Mozart, right? Hundreds of years after Mozart died, his ideas, everything, you know. The artifacts that he built, the violins that I didn't build, didn't build. Uh, if we built software, our software will crumble to dust or to, um, to bits of unused um, uh, hard drives. But the ideas that we develop may be used in longer. Mozart's ideas, <coughs> hundreds of years later, we go to concert halls to hear people read his papers. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> right? Of course, the reader, the, you know, the instrumentalists are doing amazing things too. But something was so infective, so engaging about his ideas that we still listen to them. So the ideas are the, um, the, the durable bit of what we do. The software that we build, in some ways, is super important for demonstrating ideas and, and for conveying it in a very concrete form, but nevertheless, much more ephemeral, I think. Um, and the, the other side of the coin is that, of course, if you don't communicate those ideas, no matter how brilliant you are, if you sit in a dark box and do not communicate with anybody, <laughs> all you are doing is heating up the universe. <laughs> You have to communicate in order to be an effective researcher. It's part of what the whole thing is about. Um, now, of course, this has a dual side. You think, ah, oh, I go to conferences and I read paper after paper, and all of these people have amazing ideas. They have brains the size of small asteroids. They're, they're, and I, I, I am a pitiful worm. <laughs> Nobody will be interested in my ideas. They are so 
meaningless and, and small. And indeed, when you feel like that, you do feel your ideas are, are, are small. But the truth is that you should write a paper about any idea, no matter how pitiful. Many papers that I've written have started off with something that seemed to me quite routine. And occasionally, occasionally it will turn out that the paper that you write will be fairly routine and it will just be part of your research log. Or you maybe make a blog post out of it or something. But much more often, my experience is that it turns out to be much more interesting than you first supposed. Something that seemed quite simple by the time you worked out the details has sort of ramified into something more interesting. Um, so, uh, so that. Uh, Mind it. Oh, you've been doing this for a while, right? So, uh, if you experienced this, you thought something that was sort of modest turned out to be more interesting, more complicated than you supposed? Yes, in fact, the very first paper I wrote was like that. The very first paper? And, and it was I get, uh, I, Since then, I get much better. But, um, the very first paper I wrote, in fact, I thought it was complete nonsense, and I went to my advisor and I said, I'm happy to all this stuff, but I think it's all very trivial. And when I you know, communicated the idea to him, he said, oh, on the contrary, what you think is a bug, it is a feature. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me 15 years to realize that he was right. So I'm just trying to, just try to you know, don't worry if the thing you're writing about seems a bit too easy. Just write about it anyway. If it turns out to be really easy, it won't take you very long, and you won't have wasted very long time. Okay? But it's a very good mechanism for discovering what you're interested in. Right. Um, but the last thing to say about conveying an idea is that by the time you finish the paper, you must know what that idea is. It sometimes can be hard to be sure at the beginning just what it is. But you must know at the end, and you must communicate it to your reader. I have lost count of the number of reviews that I've written in which I have said, I believe that the key idea of this paper is de dum de dum de dum. I think if only the author had thought to write down the key idea of this paper is de dum, that would have been really helpful to me as a reader. That's what so somehow the author has not done you the service of distilling what they think their key insights are. And sometimes if you did, might, you might discover that there were several of them, right? Maybe you find there were six good ideas. And then maybe you should write six papers. That's not salami slicing. That's just doing justice to any particular idea. Salami slicing is taking one idea and writing six papers. Right. So, question. Yeah? Would you put this page into the abstract? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to say a little bit about abstract. Abstract, I like to be really short. Um, but it's, it, in some ways, it doesn't matter where it is. So long as in some place in the paper, you say, I mean, have a section called the key ideas of this paper. That's quite good. Or a sentence that begins, the key idea of this paper is somewhere. Uh, not too late. So, somewhere in the first third, say. Um, yeah. Um, yes. OK. So that's the first two things. Uh, right early. Um, identify what your key ideas are, at least by the time you finish. So then, now you've got to think, how am I going to write this paper? What is the, what is the story it is going to tell? So here's a kind of sequence that works quite well for me. Right, so I want to say, here's a problem, a problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, here's why it is an interesting and perhaps important problem. Here's why it's an unsolved problem. Nobody's done this before. Here's my idea. That's back to the key idea bit, but I've led up a bit to it rather than just providing an idea out of the blue. And then there's quite a bit about how my, my idea works, and you can find lots of detail and some things of that. And then here's my how my idea, my idea compares with other people's approaches. So your goal is that your reader is going to first of all think, well, that is an interesting problem. And, oh, if you could solve that, I would be quite interested. And then you say the idea, oh, that's kind of ingenious. I wonder whether it really works out. So at each stage, you're sort of drawing them along. You're sucking them down your vortex. You're infecting their brain. So um, um, uh, but you're sort of motivating them at, uh, at each stage. OK? So, uh, so then that leads to a sort of sequence of, of ideas in the paper that works like this. So that you've got your title. Uh, oh, I put the number of readers for these. Um, uh, these things, and you notice the number of readers decreases exponentially with distance. Right, so quite a lot of people will read the title, some people will read the abstract, some people will read the introduction, um, then, there's a, you know, then, then after that it starts to fall off very sharp. Right? So what clues do you get from here? Number one, write a good title. Right? Try to put some substance in the title. If you can make it funny as well, then by all means, but you know, just the, the content is the thing. I want, I want to say a, um, 
Uh, did I want, okay, uh, that's right. Then you, maybe I'm not going to say anything about abstracts, but this is a short version. Um, abstract, I keep very short. Um, program committee authors, program committee members sometimes will use the abstract to decide whether they're going to bid to review that paper. So that's a good reason for having a slightly longer abstract. But actually, mostly the abstract is then kind of longer abstracts can, can get repeated in the introduction. So I find it, I try to keep it really short. And I also tend to write abstract last. Okay? So I'm going to say a little bit more about some of these pieces, um, which is starting with the introduction. Okay? So here we go. So introduction. Try to fit it on a page if you can. It depends a bit on the conference format. But in the old ACM2 column conference format, a page is quite a lot of material. Right? I mean, the new thing is a bit less. So um, we're trying to say, um, try to, not to say too much in the introduction. In particular, uh, don't have a sort of long, wordy introduction. Try to first, just do these two things. Describe the problem and state what your contributions are. And really, that's all you want in the introduction. So I want to say a bit more about both of those things. Firstly, describe the problem. What is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Well, um, I try to use an example to do that, rather than framing things in massive generality, which can be hard to understand. Again, this is an example from a particular paper that I wrote, so it's a sort of better that's an example of an example. Um, here's, a, here's an introduction which after four lines I was into uh, typewriter font. Right? Here's a particular case of the problem that I'm trying to solve. Then you can generalize a bit later, but it really helps readers to, to, be, to be concrete quick uh, and, and not to... Uh, and, and, and being concrete quickly is also about not being too ambitious. Sometimes in our quest to make our paper seem, ah, oh, this is a paper you're going to want to read because it solves a big problem, we describe problems that are too big. Right, so here we are. Computer programs often have bugs. It is very important to eliminate those bugs. Many researchers have tried. It's really very important. Does this make your blood flow faster in your veins? You think, oh no, I never knew that computer programs have bugs in them. Fly, that's a real worry. And this paper is going to explain how to solve that. Wonderful, I'm going to read this paper. Of course you don't. Right? It's like describing Mount Everest. And then, you know, I'm an ant, I'm going to show you the way I'm going to You know we're not going to solve the problem this time. If you say, here is a particular program which has a particularly interesting problem, you know, here is an example thereof, right? And I'm going to show an automatic way to identify and cure such bugs. Now, you, now you're in the realm of the possible, right? The reader believes you that you might actually solve that problem, and moreover, understands better what that... Do you see the difference between the highly general... And, and there's a lot of this in papers, in an, I believe, misguided attempt to set a big frame. I'm a molehill person, not a mountain person. To all that you get told about research to be ambitious. <laughs> Describe a molehill you can conquer, not a mountain that you can barely make an impression. Okay. By all means, set it in a larger context. So, but usually there's larger context. Okay. okay. So the second thing, that was about... Uh, Describing the problem. Second thing is about describing contributions. Right now, this I do suggest that you write early. What are the contributions of this paper? What are the and this is what you say. Here are the you know here's, here are the things that I think I'm going to deliver. So think of it as this is like the spec. The rest of the paper is like the implementation. This is like the specification for which you, of the things you are going to demonstrate, the, the goods that you are going to deliver, um, with pointers to the evidence. Right. So your goal at the end of the contributions is the reader thinks, wow, if she could deliver on these promises, that would be great. I think I'd better read up. Right? Or maybe I'm busy today, but now I know when to come back. Um, so here's an, I almost always do this with bullets, right? because I find reading blocks of text that contain distinctive contributions hard. So I lay them out with bullets. So here's one, one paper in which I say, no. I didn't even say in this paper, I know that here are our contributions. I usually do say here are our contributions, but then I know a referee is going to read that. Um, with the right frame of mind, and I say, you know, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm doing, and look, forward references everywhere. So each contribution, I would suggest, put a forward reference to the section in the paper that demonstrates, that is the evidence that sustains that claim. Right. These are the claims, there's the evidence. This is a claim, there's the evidence. That's the goal. Okay? Um, and it helps if your contributions can be refutable. Irrefutable contributions are not fun to read. Here are some irrefutable ones. We describe the Wizard system, it's very cool, right? We, we just show you this calculus and describe its properties. Of course you're going to study its properties. 
right? But you conveyed no information to me, really, by that time. You make some refutable claims, things that could be not delivered on. Right? If you only claim things which it is not possible to fail on delivering, then the reader doesn't have this, um, this feeling of, gosh, that would be exciting and I better read on. Okay? So, we're not going to study its properties. We're going to show that its properties you know, do something useful that makes the reader think they want to get there and give some evidence that it is. Do you see the difference? So, refutability. Crunchy. So, celery, not overcooked pasta. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, then, pointing to evidence, I've already mentioned this. Each claim, point forward to the evidence, and then you can do dead code elimination. If you find sections in the paper that have no pointer from the contributions, you think, oh, maybe this section isn't contributing anything. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's essential setup or background for some previous section, but it's a good, it's a good algorithm to follow. Um, and when I say evidence, I don't necessarily mean measurements. I mean arguments, theorems, I, you know, anything. Anything that sustains the claim. I'm, I'm doing it broadly, not narrowly. It is the reason that a, you know, a reader might ultimately think, yes, they've delivered on that claim. Okay. And in exchange for these forward references, please do not have this paragraph. How many of you have read this paragraph of, uh, that occurs at the beginning of about half of all papers with excitement <laughs> and thought, gosh, <laughs> it's no fun to read that. Right? And in fact, during the, um, uh, during the, um, the by, by doing this game with uh, contribution, that you turn it into a sort of narrative that's actually quite fun to read, and in which the forward pointer, this is like that contents list, but in a much more engaging way. Okay? Sorry, quite right. So far, so good? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what would you say about having an explicit table of contents? An explicit table of contents? Yeah. Oh, if you've got space, yes, by all means, because that doesn't get in the way. That's like a figure. Yeah. I can refer to it later. Yeah. Figure's good, yeah. like stuff that gets in my way as a reader bat. Now, another thing that might get in your way is related work. So, often, not universally, but quite often you'll find that a paper starts with a longish section of related work. And that seems like good scholarship. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and we should explain how our work, you know, the starting point from which we leap off. What could be more logical than that? Um, but in fact, related work often acts as a barrier between your poor reader and the idea to which you are trying to lead him or her. Um, and that's sad, right? So, and moreover, um, uh, you know, it, it often reads like this, you know, this very dense text. Now, why does it read like that? Well, it's partly because um, the reader doesn't know anything about the problem yet. Right? It's early in the paper. So you don't have the intellectual scaffolding to, um, to understand this kind of gobbledygook. Right? So, and moreover, since it's the beginning of the paper and you're eager to get to your idea, your tendency is to compress it. So you take already indigestible stuff and you squeeze it tight so then it becomes like highly indigestible lumps of you know, bullets that are hard to read. And the second thing is, of course, since you haven't described your idea yet, you can't give any comparative analysis. Yeah. Uh, so it's all bad. It's all bad. So the thing to do, uh, oh, th this makes your reader feel stupid, and this makes them feel tired, and this is not a good thing to do to your readers. So I just suggest that you put it at the end, right? And this works really well. That is not, so whenever, as you're going through your, your, your narrative, you should continually make citations of related work and quite often say, as we discuss in more detail in section 8, blah, blah, blah. So you're constantly demonstrating as you go through that you do know that, there's, that, that you're standing on the shoulders of giants and you are going to refer to them later. So an expert reader will not think, crumbs, you know, Simon just hasn't got a clue. Didn't he know about, you know, Matthias Felicin? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course he might not have, but um, and then that is a bit of a problem. But, um, uh, but if I just do forward references, you reassure the experts and then you get to something. But, so, so then, but the, the overall narrative is, another way to think of it is, would you do this to somebody that you were speaking to in your office at the whiteboard? Thanks. Um, would you say, before I can tell you anything about my idea, first of all, I have to tell you about the greatness of Matthias Falaiso, who is indeed a fantastic computer scientist, but you probably wouldn't. You would lead them to your idea as quickly as possible, because that is the purpose of this little conversation for having. Somebody have a, yes, um, so. Uh, would you, what do you do with that? Background. Oh, well, so, so again, you're at the whiteboard. 
would you say, Simon, I've got to tell you some background. You might, if the, in order to, lead, to get to your idea, in order to even make sense of what you're speaking about, you're going to need to be able to give me a bit of background. But you probably won't say, background, Simon. You probably say, you know, the problem I'm trying to solve with this, suppose you were trying to do this, and then you would be stuck in this way, and I'm going to help you, do you see what I mean? So think about it, it's a conversation with a person at the, at the whiteboard in your office, and that's, that's the right mindset, I think, to write the initial sections of the paper. And that will mean saying, and, you know, Matthias Falaisen had this amazing idea about how to do, uh, you know, progress and positive reservations, a way to do, um, you know, prove the, the soundness of an operational semantics or a type system. But, but you, would, you would sort of, you might say that quickly, you might say just enough to, just enough to, to take the person to your idea. Okay, that's my, that's the touchstone. Does it help get to the idea? Um, and the giving credit part is all just done in, you know, citations and forward references. You must get there, but you don't have to do it at that moment. Same for acknowledgement? Yeah, same for acknowledgement. Oh, acknowledgement's like, who helped you? Yes, do that at the end. Yeah. Yes. I've seen some people do it right at the beginning. Oh, don't do that at the beginning. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, when we get to related work, um, and this is, uh, you know, so, so um, let's see, related work, when, when you finally get to your related work, you, people often have this fallacy, right? Like, in order to make my work look good, I have to make other people's work look bad. But the truth is, that treats credit as like, uh, like money. What's your name? You are. So you are. So here is a, 20, a British 20 pound note. If I give you my 20 pound note, you are 20 pounds richer. I am 20 pounds poor, poorer, right? Money is a zero sum game. But credit is like love. <laughs> <laughs> if I give you love, right, does that mean I have less love to give away to, uh, to Crystal? Not at all. I have more. Love is kind of like, it just grows. So, I, I will actually catch yeah. <laughs> 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 Love you anyway. <laughs> so, um, so, giving credit away does, does no good, you know, does, it makes the world a better place. So, generously acknowledge um, the people who've helped you and the people who have, uh, particularly the, the, um, you know, the papers that you've read that have been inspired to you. Um, uh, you know, and, and even if they're the competition, you know, say, say the good things about them. This does not make you look bad, right? Um, and also, do acknowledge weaknesses in your approach. It's very seldom to do a piece of research which is better on all axes than everybody else. You know, you may be better. It's better in space. It's better in time. It's better for end users. It's better for professional programmers. It runs on, you know, Z80 uh, microprocessors from 1970. You know, <laughs> there, are, there are ways in which your thing is probably not as good. Everybody has compromises. Right? And if you just say, I'm better on axes A, B, and C, and you neglect to mention that on axes D and E, you're actually a lot worse, right? Then you risk the referees pointing that out and saying, Simon doesn't appear to be aware of that, right? His stuff's so much worse. That. So it, it, it pays. Not only is it intellectually honest, but it, it's actually operationally effective, more effective to acknowledge weaknesses than to make the referees point them out, okay? Let's do it. Well, it worked at the end, and with generosity. Uh, we have five minutes. Six minutes. Six minutes. Very good. Well, number six out of seven. Good. Putting a weakness first. So I want to say a little bit about um, the sort of narrative flow. So um, now we've got, we've done a bit about introduction. We talked about relation work. So this central section, you're going to sort of set up the problem and describe your idea and describe some details. Now, at this point, it's very tempting to start off with something like this. But you didn't start off like this. You started off with lots of examples and particular use cases, and then you, you finally discovered the abstraction that made everything fit together. You know, and, and then, but then you forget, somehow you, and then you become familiar with that abstraction, and the, all that earlier stuff falls away, and you think, that's the thing. And so you try to convey that, and, 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 and this is no good, right? Because this is, it makes readers feel stupid again. Take them instead, lead them to these abstractions through the medium of examples. Right, so uh, your goal is to convey intuition, primarily, primarily intuition. Um, so that the idea is that wherever a reader leaves your paper, and many of them will leave your paper without completing it, wherever they leave, they take something valuable with them. And so if they can go away with an intuition about how your idea works, that's a whole lot better than well, I understood the problem, and then I got stuck. I have no clue about what this person's solution is supposed to be. So, 
um, uh, to try to convey the intuition, which is what you would do again on the whiteboard. He would sit, you know, I'd be making eye contact with you, and the moment he started to look glazed and fall off his chair, I'd probably stop doing this and say, you know, shall we do an example? Well, and I, when I'm listening to somebody else explain something, I'm constantly saying, can you give me an example? Okay. So examples are your primary weapon. Primary weapon. Um, if you have to leave the proofs out and put them in appendix, so be it. Right? Stick them in an appendix. Don't just put the heavy stuff in the paper and leave out the intuition, is what tends to happen with the you know, compression of space. Okay? Uh, where are we? Examples, examples. Yes, so I've, I often, I, I like papers that have type. If you're ever submitting a paper that you think I'm going to referee, try to use typewriter font somewhere, in fact, quite a lot, because it's usually a signal that here's some actual sort of code, a nice example, right? And I feel, I feel, I feel a little more comfortable that, with that than with the, the Greek. But then I, I look at examples and I say, oh, okay, so that example worked and that example worked. But now, how does the general case look? How could we be sure that's the way? That, that now, as a reader, I'm sucked in. I'm thinking, oh, yes, that would be good, that would be good. And now, how would I make sure it works in general? Then you can say, I have the solution for you, Simon. You just need a synthetic epimodulus. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you ought to be careful about is that in your path, right, you will have been down many blind alleys. Right, and these blind alleys will be soaked in your blood and sweat. You will have spent days and weeks in these blind alleys thinking, oh, what do I do here? And then finally you backed out and discovered a different path. And some papers take the reader by the hand and lead them down to down the alley and show there are dismembered corpses. <laughs> 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 Uh, bloody remnants, so this is, and, and then I've actually read papers as a referee in which at the end of two pages of you know, heavy duty maps in which I've invested a significant portion of my personal time and understanding, they then say, well that was a bad idea, so <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, give me a break, so don't do that, take them, take them to the, uh, to directly to the best idea, which is to your idea. There is one exception to that, which is sometimes you are leading the reader by the hand, and there is this doorway, you know, the path ahead is a bit rocky, and there's a doorway to a garden full of dancing nymphs and the sunshine is playing the rainbows, and the reader is thinking, go there, why not go there? <laughs> so then you kind of have to explain, actually, it's full of, you know, swamp fever. <laughs> I went there and died. <laughs> so, two, minutes, two minutes ago, listen to your readers. So, um, it's very helpful to get feedback from readers. Your colleagues are excellent uh, guinea pigs, but guinea pigs can't be reused too often. It's like administering a drug, and then you watch how they squeak and fall over. <laughs> if you give them the same paper many times, they will stop reading it carefully. The other thing to be very careful is explain to your readers what you want from them. If you give it to them and say, could you say what you think of this paper? First of all, they'll say, it's a great paper, Simon, because they want to be supportive. And then they will say, you know, there's a grammar error in the, you missed out a semicolon. Right, you don't want to know that, right? You can fix the grammar on the semicolon later. What you want to know is, where did you get lost, right? So, you know, Christine, read my paper. I, I really want to know, it was page three where you fell off the horse, right? You just got stuck there. And after that, it was, you know, it was downhill all the way. I wonder, what was it about page three? And then we have a dialogue. Right? You say, well, I didn't understand this, and I scribble on the whiteboard, and I say, and, and then, you know, with a bit of luck, you say, ah, now I get it. And, and then I say, ah, how could I? And then you say, just say what you said on the whiteboard. That's often what happens, right? You just have to listen to what you said when explaining it to a person, and then you can write that down in the paper. But that's what you, you very important to explain what you want from them, or you will get the wrong thing, however, however nice. Um, and then on reviews, and I'm a person who has recently received reviews from uh, awful <laughs> referees, as some of you may have, which I think are heading for rejection, so I am bleeding at this very moment. Um, and, but, but even though you bleed, you have to uh, treat every review like gold dust and treat it as a way, instead of saying that stupid referee who just doesn't get the book, just, they just don't get it, uh, biased or ill qualified or something, instead say, how could I rewrite the paper so not even a stupid referee could make that mistake? <laughs> So it's, uh, it's really hard to take on board um, reviews that are critical, whether from your friends or completely anonymous. But also remember that, do I say this? Yes, that's right, that, it's, um, that <laughs> referees who read your papers have given up one problem, one thing that is not like credit, it is not infinitely divisible, it is completely finite, that is their time. They have given you an hour or two of their time that they will never have again. It is a slice of their life that they have completely given over to you. 
And that is something to be truly grateful for. I think it's a really good thing about ours, you know, scientific community, that people are willing to do this. I hope that you will do it for other people. But it does mean that you need to, in your heart, be truly grateful to them. Right. Don't say this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there you go. Uh, any any other observations, questions, suggestions? This is, I say, something on, even on this sort of, uh, you know, the, the um, more experienced spirits researchers in the room may have comments as well. But, yeah. How much PL notation in the paper is too much? How much what? PL notation. How much PL notation? Is too much. Is too much. Yeah. I don't know, it's really hard to be specific about. So I suppose you need, enough, you mean by formal notation, all those sort of Greek things. So I, for me, I find it's very helpful to have stuff to refer to. I love figures, right? Show me the syntax of your type system. Show me the typing judgments, but they're not in line the text. Then explain using examples. So, so I like reference material that makes me feel there's substance behind, and perhaps pointers to appendices. Um, but the, um, uh, and then in the running text, just enough formal notation to, well, to convey the idea, to, to lead your reader by the hand. Think of you, know, try on your office mates, or your colleagues, to see if they get it. Yeah, oh, big so, so nobody else is by Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it's the cream of the world programming language community here. You're not meant to be silent. Yes. And when and where do you put proofs in a paper? When and where do you put proofs in the paper? Well, you mentioned mostly. The that's right. So, usually in the compass of a conference paper, it's quite impressive if you've got enough space to do, you know, a proof of any complexity. Sometimes the proof is delightfully simple, and then it's rather nice to be able to put it in. Oftentimes it's shown. It's, it's often appendix. Occasionally, the proof technique is itself part of what you're trying to describe, and then of course you must, you must put it in. But mostly, I think people will take proofs on trust, particularly if they're machine checked. Uh -huh. um, if you uh, put them in an appendix and include a pointer to it, um, and that gives you more space for your, you know, for the ideas and intuition part. So that would be my default place. Uh, yeah. You've already eliminated some, but what are other things you don't like? Oh, what are the things I don't like to see? Um, something else may... This is left as an exercise for the reader. Yes. <laughs> it is very interesting to read papers with some of these things in mind and to think, what, what didn't I, you know, what, what excited me about this paper? What made me feel energized and what made me feel... Um, think about it in terms of energy. What makes you feel like reading? So I try to identify the, the big things. I'm not trying to think that they also apply. Somebody else was over here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, please. Other than kind of starting writing a paper early in the short circuit, I did, do you have any suggestions to avoid like, deadline crunch or like, how to structure the Any work? suggestions for how to avoid what? Oh, to deadline, deadline crunch. Yeah. Oh, deadlines are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they are. You know, I'm, 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 every time everybody says we should make our PR conferences have, you know, open deadlines you can submit any time or just spit out conference proceedings every three months, I'm thinking, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm motivated powerfully by the annual deadline for ICRP. It makes me get things done. So, in some ways, that's you know, in praise of deadline crunch. But um, I, I, don't think I, I don't think I have anything very specific to say except. Um, you know, be aware of them coming up. Maybe plans up three months before, you know, the, the deadline for a conference. You think you might actually like think, you know, have I got something that would be ready to go for that? But oftentimes it's the other way around. I think I've got an idea that's sort of gestating. I've started to write about it, you know, and I think actually I could get this into a publishable form now. What is the next appropriate venue? And then I use that as a driving function, you know. So it's uh, always, because the deadlines for different conferences come under different times of year. So there's usually one that's an appropriate distance. Let's do one, one more while we... There was someone over here. Yeah, I yeah, just yeah. wanted to add to the uh, appendix thing and proofs. Write your proofs. Like, seriously, when you lay it and show it to someone, put it in the appendix. Even if it's damn stupid, you probably have mistakes there. And sometimes uh, that leads to back to papers. Yeah, you, you, you might just, you might, it's rather like writing a paper, you discover a lot of things you didn't understand and things you got wrong. When you write the proof, one of the great things about proofs is you may discover it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's good finding out about it in the past, right? 